Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, where we discuss DNA regulation and the insights it can tell you about your health. I'm Hannah Wendt, and I'm the founder of Everything Epigenetics. Today, my guest is Dr. Sarah Voison. A couple years ago, Dr. Voison published a paper which is able to produce an epigenetic clock which predicts your chronological age from skeletal muscle tissue. By the end of today's episode, you should have answers to important basic questions such as what is skeletal muscle, why is it important, and how does it relate to the aging process? You'll also have answers to the questions like how do you create an epigenetic clock and what is an EWAS study? We will cover all of that. But first, a little introduction to my guest. Dr. Boyson is an NHMRC early career fellow working as a senior postdoc within the genetics and epigenetics of exercise research group at the Institute of Health and Sport, Victoria University, Melbourne, Australia. She uses advanced statistical and bioinformatics methods to understand how the epigenome interacts with age and sex, those intrinsic factors, and then extrinsic factors as well, such as your exercise and your diet to actually influence the human health. During her PhD, she developed a unique bioinformatics pipeline to systematically annotate the epigenome and use data mining to integrate complex genetic and epigenetic data from multiple cohorts and multiple tissues of the human body. As a postdoc, she established an epigenetic clock, like I mentioned, for skeletal muscle with collaborator Steve Horvath. That will be our main discussion today. This is available as an open access bioconductor R package called Meat to predict biological age using muscle DNA methylation profiles. I will put that in the show notes for any of you who are interested in taking a check at that code. Subsequently, she used data mining and her extensive network of collaborators to meta-analyze results from 12 cohorts and 1,000 human muscle samples, which identified a robust age-related epigenetic change in muscle. She has made these results available as an open access user-friendly web tool called MetaMeth. She recently even led a comprehensive review on how to quantify the aging epigenome and showed her vision to advance the aging field with several experts in this space. Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, Dr. Boys, and I'm extremely excited to have you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really, really pleased to be here. Yeah, I'm very interested in your journey in particular. I know you're using you know, statistics and bioinformatics. And, and I really want to understand what piqued your interest in that. I don't think I've had any bioinformaticists or biostaticians on the show quite yet. So you're really using these skills in the epigenetic space. Can you tell me a little bit about your story and how you got where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, my interest in statistics and bioinformatics stems from um, my love for math and logic that I think I developed from an early age by playing a lot of video games growing up. And uh, in middle and high school, I discovered the world of genetics, and that fascinated me enormously. And I understood that I could study biology to try to understand human beings because they fascinate me. And uh, I think that moving towards bioinformatics and statistics was just the perfect marriage of the, those two passions of mine. Definitely. No, a su super interesting background. And because I can, I can really resonate with the biology space or the science world, but I think then we really need more, more of the interpretations of what that actually means on more of a mathematical level. So your skill set is definitely valued, especially in, in our epigenetic space here, as we're using predictors of, of all sorts of different things as we're applying them to the, the DNA methylation data. So what I, why I wanted to have you on this, this podcast is you, you have an amazing paper that was published you know, a couple years back titled An Epigenetic Clock for Human Skeletal Muscle. And I loved reading your paper. I encourage anyone that is listening to give that, that paper a read. Um, so so I, I want to first start discussing the, the why behind this paper. Can you give some background regarding the importance of skeletal muscle tissue and, and aging? Why do we care in the first place? So um, it's really important to understand that uh, muscle tissue is the tissue that allows us to perform daily tasks and activities that give us independence and life enjoyment. You know, you are you're able to walk, to lift, to run, to hike, to dance, and to do all of these things because you have muscles. And as we age, unfortunately, we lose considerable muscle mass and muscle strength. And therefore, we lose a great deal of quality of life because muscle deteriorate as we age. 
So it's very important to nurture the muscle during aging. Yeah, absolutely. And would you encourage then to, you know, our listeners, I know a big question that I get is, you know, when should I start weightlifting or, or even moving my body a little bit more? It doesn't have to be heavy weightlifting, right? You could be moving boxes or, or different things of the sort. When should I start that? Or what's, what's really the age? How, how should I, you know, they really want a workout plan from, from start to finish. What would be your recommendation based off of that question? So I think that the recommendation I would give is you start now, like whether you're young or old and as early as you can, it's a bit like playing an instrument. The earlier you start, the better it is. And you need to keep doing it um, throughout your life. I see the nurturing of your muscles through exercise as a hygiene sort of routine, just like you brush your teeth. I think you should exercise and move your body in the same way. Uh, and uh, weightlifting in particular is very important. Like we underestimate weight, the importance of weightlifting for men and women alike and at all ages. Yeah, that's that's interesting because you know, I've, I've become an avid weightlifter. I, you know, in the, the past couple of years, I've always been super athletic. I played three different sports in high school, played a little bit of, of club soccer and, and college as well, and have really always been active, I would say, but more cardio, right? You think cardio is going to burn the most calories. And, and I think that's a, a a flaw in, in our thinking and, and how we've been raised and, and what we know about exercise today. So I, I've since shifted to this, this weightlifting model and um, it's, it's great. It's almost like a, a weightlifting high, like when people say they get their runners high, right? And um, this morning, I definitely didn't want to go to the gym and, and work out. Um, but since I've been in this habit, it's almost like I could go on autopilot and put my body through it. And I'm so glad I, I remembered I, I was speaking with you today. And I was like, I can't not lift weights on the day that, that I'm interviewing Dr. Boyson. So um, <laughs> how how often should, should people lift weights? I know there's a really big argument in the space as well that we should have these rest days. And, and I don't think humans, you know, are, are meant to rest all the time. I think even in our rest days, we need to walk or do some stretching and, and be, be active. But what, what do you think in terms of, of how many times per week or, or how long? So I am in no means an expert on this. So take my advice with a grain of salt because I am not a registered, uh, you know, uh, personal trainer or anything like this. This is just secondhand knowledge that I gathered through my reading. Uh, but I think that the recommendation currently is weightlifting twice a week or something similar. Of course, you can do more if you like. It's based on personal preference as well. Um, but definitely at least twice a week. And as you said, uh, only cardio is going to give you only limited benefits. I mean, it's going to give you great benefits, but limited. And in particular, in the... Um, in, in view of injuries, a lot of people underestimate how good weightlifting is to avoid injury, um, especially if you practice another sport that might be at a higher level. So I would say that um, as long any form of activity that allows you to move your body, and in particular with weight, weightlifting, try to go as heavy as you can, but obviously, you know, do not push yourself to the point of, of breaking. That's the general right. <laughs> Definitely. That's, that's what holds me back. I would say, oh, you know, this feels pretty heavy. I could probably go a little bit heavier, but you know, I don't, I don't want to because of X, Y, or and Z or because I'm tired. So the, you know, mm -hmm. we always need to push ourselves a little bit more to, to our limits because you could probably lift a lot more than, than you can. It's, it's really just more of that mental block too. So, um, you know, I really encourage anyone who, who, may be, be interested or on the fence uh, regarding weightlifting to just at least start, you know, start with uh, some cans of soup in your, in your kitchen or, you know, two and a half uh, pound weights because we're, we're going to um, lose that muscle mass as we age. So it's, it's never too, too late to start, you know, begin now and, and try and, and keep some of that muscle. Yes. And I, also, so uh, sorry, I just want to get one point across because I hear this a lot from people. Even older individuals can lift weights and it is not dangerous for them to lift weights. A lot of people are worried that they're going to injure themselves and it is safe. I just want to state that out loud. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so, so yeah, I, uh, again, you know, I really want to encourage my parents to even lift weights, to be a little bit more active too, because it, it really, really starts to decline as, as you become older chronologically. Um, so Dr. Boyson, I want to hear a little bit about the background of this paper. What started it? I'm always super interested to hear, you know, how you came about to, to this question and how you started this paper. Can you give us a little bit of background about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, this paper, is basically building an epigenetic clock, which is a predictor of chronological age based on skeletal muscle epigenetic profiles. 
And the reason why I decided to build this clock is because there were there was at the time a clock that was available for all tissues that was known as the Horvath Pan Tissue Clock that was developed in 2013. But I tried to apply this clock to my data in muscle, the data that I was handling at the time. And I noticed that this clock performed rather poorly in skeletal muscle compared with the other tissues um, that were available out there, such as blood, adipose tissue, brain, etc. And I didn't really understand why. And I dug into the paper. And when I looked deeper, I realized that when Horvath developed his clock in 2013, there were virtually no DNA methylation data sets in muscle available at the time. So he, when he developed his clock, he didn't put any muscle data to develop the clock, which means that the clock performed rather poorly in this tissue. Because you have to know that epigenetic patterns are rather tissue specific. And there are some changing changes that are happening with age that are restricted to certain tissues. And so um, I... By the time I became interested in this in 2019, many data sets had become available, uh, allowing me to build a muscle specific clock that could predict an individual's chronological age based on, based on their DNA methylation patterns in muscle. Perfect. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, some of our uh, listeners will be familiar with that 2013 Horvath pan tissue or, or multi tissue clock. Um, if, if, if that clock should work well in, in all tissues, why don't you think it was represented well then with the skeletal muscle? Were there were there also, were were there other excuse me tissue or organ groups that weren't very well represented in the clock as well? Um, I do not know. I haven't looked specifically at which tissues were not really well represented aside from muscle because I was just ha handling that type of data. There might be some speci very specific tissues such as I don't know. Um, ovaries or some things that are pretty rare or diff I mean like heart for example heart is also a, very, a tissue that's difficult to get in humans uh, so I'm not too sure but there are probably other tissues that are yeah. absolutely and, and how did you get um, you know the samples that you were working with with that skeletal muscle so that was one of the like one of the interesting parts of this paper, at least and also in my journey as a, as a researcher, because it involved a lot of data mining. So I felt like I was Sherlock Holmes trying to find all the cues that was out there to be able to gather all the data that I that I could to build this clock, which meant looking, first of all, in um, online repositories. So all the online databases that are now overflowing with molecular data, such as the gene expression omnibus platform, the dbGaP database of genotypes and phenotypes, array express, and all those great platforms where people just dump their data. And I just dug into it and I, and I found a lot of data sets that I could use, but it was not sufficient to build a really good clock. So I also reached out to my network of collaborators around the world from Europe, from the US, uh, from Australia, because I knew that they had some data at some point, some sitting somewhere that I could potentially use. And this is one of the things that I love about academia and science. People are so collaborative and so open and they allowed me to use their data very generously, allowing this big effort, which, you know, uh, yeah, led to the clock. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I think that's one of the things you know, that's, that's great with all of the technology that, that we have today is we're able to collaborate and come together. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to return the favor for all of those people who sent you information to use for your skeletal muscle clock as well, right? Because we can only get so much of that data from the, the online data mining and then having some, some collaborators around the world is, is always, always helpful too. Um, so, you know, diving deeper a little bit into that point, when people discuss epigenetic clocks, they get really excited because they're, they always go to this idea of, of biological aging and, and how they're, they may be aging on a cellular level. And that's super exciting in the field, right? We know if you're, you're biological age um, in any sense, whether it's a first generation, second generation, or third generation clock is above your chronological age, you are at risk for almost every single chronic disease and, and death as well. But what I don't think people understand is really how these epigenetic age clocks are created. There's a lot of work, a lot of time that goes into this and, and effort put into the development of, again, these epigenetic clocks or these predictors. So I want to spend some, some time really diving deeply into this process. How did you create this muscle clock? Can, can you describe the process? So I think you just went over the first step, which was actually getting that data. So you have the data, what do you do with it from there? So once I got my hands on the data, the first thing that I need to check was that um, I had sufficient sample size because 
you need a substantial amount of data to build a clock. And the reason for this is because um, human molecular data is usually very noisy. You have a lot of, you have a signal that you're trying to capture, but a lot of other factors can influence your DNA methylation levels and make them vary to a degree that is masking the signal that you're trying to detect. So I needed at least a thousand samples. So I, you know, I, I managed to get there, um, but it was, it was uh, challenging. <laughs> Second uh, thing that was very important for me to check was that each cohort or each data set that I had my hands on displayed a broad age range. Uh, to be able to detect changes in DNA methylation that are associated with age, I need individuals in my data set to vary in age. I cannot build a clock if my data set only contains uh, people who are 50 years old because they don't vary in age. So my data is not going to vary at all. So it was very important to check that the age uh, was variable between data sets and inside data sets as well. Um, and then I just decided to go with the method that Horvath had implemented in his 2013 paper, which was to use a machine learning algorithm called ElasticNet. So what you have to know is that there are new developments in the field of epigenetic clocks, especially work by Morgan Levine. And she mm -hmm. developed, I think, a better way to use DNA methylation data to build a clock that does not use necessarily elastic nets. But I am not entirely familiar, familiar with it, but I just know that these perform better now. Uh, mm -hmm. With regards to elastic nets, um, it, is, it is actually, in, I mean, I, I was really scared to use it at first because I didn't know anything about <laughs> machine learning. But thanks to Steve Horvath, who actually put his code completely open access, I could reuse his code and try to dig into it and understand exactly what he did. And ElasticNet um, is a really beautiful piece of algorithm that actually tries to find the best combination of features in your data. In, in this case, the features are DNA methylation sites called the CPG sites. So it tries to find the best combination of those sites uh, that can predict the outcome of interest as accurately as possible. So you can ask ElasticNet to predict chronological age. You can, you can ask uh, the algorithm to predict anything you want. You can predict sex, you can predict anything. Um, and each feature uh, is actually assigned a specific weight. And then all the features are summed up together. They are linearly combined into one particular measure that predicts uh, with high precision somebody's age based on their DNA methylation level. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. Like I said, I don't think we've had anyone on the show yet really dig into elastic net regression modeling or how these are, are actually created. And um, that's a, a really just, you know, definition by by book of, of how we're, we're diving into this data. So you you go through this elastic net regression modeling and, and what do you find? How many CPGs actually make up the skeletal clock? And remember, a CPG is going to be that cytosine, phosphate, and guanine. So you have your two nucleotides with that phosphate bond holding it together, and that's going to be the location of methylation in that genome. Correct me if I'm wrong on, on any of that, Dr. Voisin, but how, how many... Yeah, CPGs did you find and, and um, give, give us some insight there. So, I mean, if I'm really honest, I don't remember the number of CPG sites in the clock because actually the right, I mean, the, the CPGs that are selected to build the clock are, in my opinion, they're nothing special. The clock could have selected a different set of CPGs altogether and, uh, you know, um, it could have arrived at, at a prediction of age that would be just as accurate or slightly less accurate, ever so slightly. And it could be a completely different set of CPGs. So there's nothing special about this particular 100 or 200 CPG sites that um, are contained in the clock. Uh, because what you have to know is it's a, the clock itself, it's a very artificial process. It's a machine learning. It's artificial intelligence. And it's, it's by definition artificial. It doesn't give you... I don't think, much insight into the entire biology of the aging muscle. It is purely um, a program to uh, predict age. So and the number of sites didn't really matter to me, to be honest. And, I, and, and that is such a great answer because a lot of times people think if a clock has a higher number of CPGs, then it's a better clock. And that is just not correct, right? I know off the top of my head, the, the 2013 Horvath one has 353. The Dr. Gregory Hannum one has 71. Um, you know, I think Pheno age is around the, the 500 area, which is Dr. Morgan Levine's second generation clock. So 
they're all varying. There's some clocks that only have three CPGs, right? Um, so, so they're all varying. And I think that's a very big misconception in the space is that people think with, with more positions, it's, it's better. But like you said, that's machine learning. That is just a, a predictor. It's, 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 it's a prediction outcome. Um, we don't really necessarily know on the biological level what those, those CPGs are meaning or what that methylation is, is actually telling us. Um, there can be prediction based predictions based off of that. And there are some groups out there, some really great research groups who are looking more at the causation of aging and what positions might actually be causing us to age. So that's a, a completely different question and, you know, completely different interview um, to, to have, but really appreciate the, the, um, the honesty and the feedback there regarding the number of, of, of sites. And your muscle clock is going to outperform the pan tissue clock, correct? In, in um, reporting out that, that age. So can you explain this further? How, how does that perform better than um, Dr. Horvath's 2013 clock? So it performs better just because if you uh, use a particular sample of muscle from a person who was, let's say, 50 years of age, uh, mm -hmm. the muscle clock that, I, that we developed actually together with Steve Horvath is just going to predict that person's age with better accuracy. So there is a, there is a smaller error in the prediction uh, of the age. So the person might be predicted to be 52 years old with the meat clock, so the muscle clock, versus something <laughs> like 60 with the Horvath pen tissue clock. So it's just a more accurate, but there's nothing more magical more about it, I would say. Perfect, yeah. And it's, it's a first generation clock, correct? So it's, it's used Absolutely. to predict the chronological age within using that, that skeletal muscle. Um, so the second part of your study, I found this super interesting as well. So if you're, you're reading Dr. Voison's study and you move on to, to more of the second half, you, you also performed an epigenome wide association study or what people call an EWAS study, um, of, of age in your paper. Let's start with describing what an EWAS study is. Yes, absolutely. So EWAS actually is, it's very similar to a GWAS that you might be familiar with. It's actually a hypothesis, hypothesis free approach that is used to identify the DNA methylation loci, so the epigenetic loci in this case, that are statistically associated with a particular trait of interest. And in our case, it was age, chronological age. So the way that this, um, this works is that it, it tries for every single CPG site that is in your data. It tries just to align your model to associate the methylation level at this site with age adjusting for other potential confounders such as sex and disease and whatever you want. And then it does a particular type of correction to uh, avoid false positive findings. And then you end up with a list of DNA methylation loci that are called DMPs that are statistically significantly associated with age. Perfect, and, and what does the DMP stand for again? differentially methylated position. Position, okay. And is that the same as the DMR, the differentiated methylated region? So a DMR, actually, it's a contiguous stretch of DNA that harbor multiple DMPs. So a DMR is composed of multiple DMPs. Perfect. Thank you for that, that clarification there. And what did you find in your EWAS study? So we found uh, actually a balanced a number of DNA methylation sites, so DMPs, that increased in methylation with age or decreased in methylation with age. And uh, we also found that those loci that change with age in the genome are not randomly distributed. They are enriched in specific regions of the genome that perform specific functions, such as enhancers, uh, intergenic regions, and promoters, etc. So I won't go maybe into the, all the details of it, but there is, um, there is a very specific distribution of where these changes happen with age in the genome. It's not just randomly distributed, which gives an insight as to uh, what is the upstream reason why this epigenome changes in the first place during aging and what is the actual cause of those changes. So I think this is the interesting part of it. Sure. Yeah. Let's go into the details. No, I want to, I want to hear them. So what, if, if you don't mind, um, what, you know, what sites were they more related to, you know, skeletal muscle and, and aging or, or kind of what were those groupings? Yes. So when looking first at the function of the genes that displayed a, a difference in methylation during aging, I found that those genes were um, particularly, uh, they were 
I would I will use the term enriched. So what I mean by that is that many of those genes that changed with age in, in muscle at the epigenetic level were involved in skeletal muscle structure and function, such as myosin, troponin, and all those kinds of proteins that make up the muscle itself. Um, so it just uh, confirmed to me that the signal that I was detecting during aging might be um, functionally involved in the degradation of muscle during aging, and the, especially the decline in in muscle strength and um, muscle mass during aging. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for for that description. I um, again, I, I would want to use the um, you know muscle clock on on myself, and and I know you mentioned the the meat package, which we'll we'll talk about how people can access that at at the end here. Um, so that leads me to what's the utility or application of your clock? You know, if if someone's tested their their methylation and they have a, a 450k, they have their IDAT files, or they have the 850k, or or some of their raw data. Can they use it, or you know, where do you think this is? You're going to see your your clock um, used most widely. Yes, so I think that uh, the first development that I see uh, using the first, I mean, it's a first generation clock, so it can give mm -hmm. you, unfortunately, little insight into the biological aging of your muscle, because because I asked my algorithm to predict age with, with as much as accuracy, accuracy as possible, it selected those methylation sites that change with age and nothing else. Like it, it didn't select the methylation sites that change with exercise or diet or anything else that counters the degradation of your muscle as you age. So it's a first generation sure. clock. So you need, we need to take this with a grain of salt. But I think that the application of this clock might be in future reprogramming experiments that are currently being tested in mice and that I see could be applied to human muscle culture to try to, for example, uh, treat those muscle with um, OSKM factors or uh, reprogramming factors, or maybe with molecules such as NAD to try to understand whether those particular um, molecules that are known to have anti-aging properties, at least in animal models or in other cells, could potentially rejuvenate the epigenetic age of skeletal muscle. And to what degree and what that actually means for the function of the muscle, etc. The second, Perfect. yeah. No, I was going to say the the second potential application, but that's like far fetched, is in forensics, <laughs> um, because yeah. uh, because a piece of muscle found on a crime scene, you could look at the DNA methylation level of this piece of muscle and determine the age uh, of the person that to whom this piece of muscle belonged. But I think this is far fetched because blood is more readily available and more useful in this context. Definitely. Talking about the second application, that's very interesting because that's really how I heard of or a part of how I heard of DNA methylation testing and its utility, you know, back in 2011 and in 2013 when these first generation clocks really came out is you could use blood from a crime scene or even even muscle now. And, um, you know, they, they even were really used um, at the beginning for um, people to, to seek asylum, to see if they were old enough to seek asylum. So they're really great at predicting chronological age. And those first generation clocks still have utility for those purposes if you accurately want to predict, you know, that specific interest um, and, and outcome, which would be that chronological age. Going back to your, your first application, um, so for, for a study there, you could do, and, and let me know if this is what you're imagining, but you could do a... Um, you could you could start with mice, right? And you could take uh, a muscle tissue, and you could test their their age based on that muscle. And then you could intervene with something like NAD, or I think you were talking about the reprogramming factors, right? Like the Yamanaka factors, correct? And then do you know wait a certain amount of time, and then retest afterwards to see how their chronological age based on their skeletal muscle is is being affected. Would that be something you were you were thinking along the lines of? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's exactly what I was thinking about, uh, knowing that the clock that I built is specific for humans. So I would not go through mice at all. It would be directly applied to human muscle cultures. Uh, but yes, this is exactly the line of thinking. So in humans, perfect. And can you just explain a little bit more? Um, and, and again, forgive me, this is maybe not your specialty, but can you describe just the Yamanaka factors for our listeners? I think that may be a little bit of a foreign um, um, subject for them, or even just some of the reprogramming factors. Yeah, so the, um, I know little about it, but I just know that these factors, um, these are four proteins, four transcription factors, uh, whose combination was actually found to 
turn a differentiated adult cell back into a baby stage of a sort of a um, <laughs> differentiated cell, which yeah. uh, uh, which actually got Yam uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who found those factors, the Nobel Prize, because this this discovery is has many applications for I don't know organ transplant for trying to rejuvenate tissues and in the aging field in particular. So these, these, uh, the combination of these four proteins turns back the clock, if you will, to a baby stage, uh, with the caveat that there is one, one of the four I know that uh, tends to turn the tissue in cancerous. And I know that one of them has been removed lately in experiments to try to rejuvenate the tissue without turning it into a teratoma. But once again, I'm not super familiar with that. No, understood. I appreciate that answer. That just gives our, our audience at least a picture or, or some insight. And I know that's really what Altos Labs is, is working on now, a lot of those cellular reprogramming options to, to see how we can turn the age of those cells back to stage zero or those those baby cells. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with in the years to come. So Dr. Voison, what's next for you? What have you currently been studying or, or looking at? Or tell us your interests. Tell us what we can expect in, in the next coming years from you. So I have actually a big project that I'm working on at the moment that is probably going to take me another two years to complete. But once it's completed, I'm going to be very happy with it because it's, <laughs> it is absolutely a mammoth task. So my, my goal is to build an atlas of epigenetic aging across all human tissues at the cell type resolution by combining something like 75,000 uh, DNA methylation profiles across 18 tissues. And uh -huh. I want to build that huge atlas so people can understand exactly what type of DNA methylation changes happen in which cell type, in which organs. And um, further down the line, what I want to do as well is to investigate sex differences in the aging profiles, because we know that men and women do not age similarly or at the same rate. And I want to understand whether this is true at the epigenetic level and in which tissues, and whether this actually explains why for example, women develop more Alzheimer's, while men Parkinson's, and whether it has some uh, actual application to understand sex differences in age-related diseases. Wow, I am excited for that. <laughs> and I'll have to have you back on when you complete that project too. So will, will the Atlas, will that be publicly available to researchers or anyone? Uh, my, so Perfect. a big part of the project is to build an open access, user-friendly, transparent website where people can browse uh, anything they want, a bit like the GTEx portal, clicking on a tissue and understanding which side changes to what degree with age, because this is only when we build an atlas of this kind that then we can test experiments in human tissues to know whether the reprogramming factors can actually affect, uh, you know, this tissue or that tissue. So once we have the base, the atlas, then we can move on to understanding, uh, yeah, the effect of anti-aging therapies. Yeah, and that's your, your gift back to the community, right? Again, all those people shared their data with you regarding the skeletal muscle clock for you to build that. So that's great. I love when the community comes together and we're, we're sharing all this information and data. I'm particularly interested in the male versus female um, information and what you'll find from that because there's always that, that sex paradox where men typically age a little bit quicker than women and they die younger too. A recent article came out that shows, and I'm Forgive me as I don't remember which clock they actually used, but it showed that men are typically about four years older biologically compared to women. I think it was one of the first generation clocks. So that would be super interesting at a cellular level to understand that a little bit further. I think a lot of the, um, you know, you know, questions stem from that, especially, you know, most of these interventional trials you'll, you'll see done on men, for example. So, you know, women, I think, are, are a little bit underrepresented there and we can find out why um, and, and why we're developing these diseases earlier, too. Exactly. Perfect. And my last question for you, um, it's a curveball. I ask everyone this at the end of the, the podcast, <laughs> Dr. Wilson. If you could be any animal in the world, what would you be and why? Oh my God, if I could be any animal. I think, <laughs> okay, this is a random one, but I, this is a question that I've thought about in the past and I would be a cat. Uh, you have the best really? of everything. Oh yeah, you have the best of everything. You hunt as much as you want. You're being fed, pat, and I, I, I would love to be a cat, I think. I love that you've thought about that question because I've thought about the question too. I haven't, haven't given my answer out yet, but a, a really, a, a handful of people have said cat, cat is winning for the same reasons that you just said, you know, they have cats and, and they, they are sleeping or they're, you know, fed all the time in their pet. Do you, do you have any cats at home then? I used to, uh, I actually, uh, yeah, I, I used to, but yeah, I love cats. They're my spirit animal, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, favorite animal. Well, I really appreciate your time. We've we've come to the end of this amazing podcast interview. For listeners who want to connect with you, where can they find you? And and can you talk about where they can find your your code as well? Yes. So I do have a GitHub account. So with uh, my name, Sarah Voisin. So you can find all the code uh, uh, that I upload on my GitHub regularly as I move on to different projects. Uh, I'm also, um, I can be reached with my work email uh, that is now at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, so I'm pretty sure you will share that email with the listeners. So. Absolutely. I'll put everything in, in the show notes. And why is it called the meat package? What does that stand for? I love it. I think it's a great fit, but what does it stand for again? So uh, MEAT stands for Muscle Epigenetic Age Test. And to be fair, I am not the one who found that acronym, but it was one of my yes. colleagues whom I presented the, the, the clock to, and he looked at me and he says, you should call it MEAT. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he gave me the acronym and I thought it was so spot on. I had to, I had to use it. Yeah. You said Muscle Epigenetic Age. And what does the T stand for? Test, test. Perfect. I love it. Um, well, thank you so much for, for joining us, Dr. Voison, at the Everything Epigenetics podcast. And remember, you have control over your epigenetics. So stay tuned next time to learn more. Thank you so much.